Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So today I'm going to be uh, exploring a question that was sent in by a viewer. And the question was something along the lines of uh, how does hyperthreading affect SIMD? Or sort of conversely, how is SIMD affected by hyperthreading? So I've written a whole bunch of benchmarks just to explore this question. And uh, I think it's really interesting. So let's, uh, let's have a bit of a look. Okay, so we're going to have a whole bunch of different uh, tests or experiments and some of them are going to test out uh, hyperthreading and some of them are just going to test out multi-core. So the idea is pretty much just to uh, have a bit of a look at the performance that we can get from uh, hyperthreading and or multi-core. Before we go too much further, I just want to point out the uh, overall idea. Pretty much whenever you're uh, hyperthreading, what you want to do is uh, you want to be able to split your workloads. So something like floating point and integer workloads going through two different hyperthreads in one core will generally give you a little speed boost. Yeah, but if your threads do pretty much the same instructions, then what you'll find is that hyperthreading doesn't really do anything. And the cores are just waiting for the AOUs or the arithmetic logic units to finish executing. Yeah, you pretty much just get scalar performance. They don't run in parallel. All right, so that's the overall findings from all of these tests, just in case you can't be bothered watching the whole video. But let's get stuck into it, eh? Okay, so for the tests, I've set all of the thread priorities to maximum. That's two in Windows using the set thread priority function. I've used the set thread affinity function to force hyperthreads and or to force multi-core without using hyperthreads. Yeah, so have a bit of a look at set thread priority and set thread affinity if you're not used to those, but um, yeah, they're interesting functions. There's something called thermal throttling where the CPU will actually underclock itself when it starts to get too hot. So just in case that was an issue, I've also recorded the clock cycle counts. Yeah, so the cycle counts you'll see on the very right hand side of the data, um, that's just to kind of get around thermal throttling. The loop count is actually a billion. Yeah, it's not written in a lot of the code that we're going to see, but yeah, it's a billion. And I'll be putting up a bit of a write-up and the code that I was using. It's pretty kind of dodgy, but I'll be putting that up for the Patreons just as a big thank you for the support of the channel. And if you'd like to support the channel, then uh, you can jump over to Patreon or you can run over to um, Facebook and say hello. Yeah, all good. Oh, and also I want to say that uh, AMD has something called SMT, so streaming multi-threading, I guess, something like that. But um, it's similar to hyper-threading, yeah, but I've only actually tested this on uh, this particular CPU here, which is a 10300H, little mobile chip. This might not be completely applicable to AMD. We're just testing um, hyper-threading, which is an Intel technology. All right, but let's move on to the first workload. Okay, so this is the first workload just here. I've got this little unrolled loop and it's using ink the ink instruction eight times. So the ink instruction is gonna be executed one billion times when the um, little counter here runs through this loop. And the ink instruction is a general purpose integer instruction. And here is a little table representing the results that we got. So you see the number of threads over the very side there, one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four again. That second group of four is the hyper threading threads. So the first group is actually multi-core. Yeah, I forced those threads through the four different cores. And then the second group of threads are actually hyperthreaded, the pairs. So threads one and two are in core one, hyperthreading, and threads three and four are in core two, hyperthreading. Okay, so you can see the mean scores there. That's the mean time in milliseconds, 72, 73, 74, 76 for um, multi-core. You see that that takes around about the same amount of time. So as you add threads, actually doing more work, yeah, so four threads can actually do about four times the amount of work. If we have a look over here in this um, comparison columns, we can see comparison to one in time. The very top row there in comparison to one in time, well, that is the first row, so that just has a one there. And then after that, as we add cores, um, that comparison time gets multiplied by the number of cores that we've added, or the number of threads, because the workload has doubled when you've got two cores. And then for um, three threads, you see that we're getting almost three times the performance, so about 2.92 times the performance of one thread. And then for four threads running multi-core, we get about 3.81 times the performance of one thread. So that's pretty much what you'd expect. It's more or less linear. Yeah, so 3.81 is almost four. It's almost four times the workload. Yeah, so if you do multi-core for four cores, you should get um, almost a linear speed up. But if we have a look down here at hyper threading version you see something pretty interesting so the first two um, little runs just there we get uh, about one times the performance for one thread that's fair enough really there's no hyper threading if there's just one thread but then as we add another thread 
We see the same performance, it's about one. Yeah, so we're performing at about the same speed as if we just had one thread. And the reason for that is that this workload up here, all of these little ink instructions, they all need the same pipes. So the hyper threads aren't actually able to run in parallel. They just have to wait for each other. Yeah, wait for the pipes to be free so that they can execute their ink. So they sort of take it in turns and the end result is that the first two hyper threads, which are running in one core, they actually don't perform well at all. Yeah, they perform in series, one after another. And then as we add the third hyper thread, that actually goes to core number two. So we do actually see a little improvement there. We get 1.5 times the one th thread performance. And then as we add a fourth hyper thread, that moves up to two. So what you can see from this is that when the hyper threads have to wait for each other, um, they actually end up performing in series. Yeah, so all these four hyper threads just here actually perform the same as two cores would. Yeah, we're pretty much just getting um, two cores running in parallel. Yeah, here's a chart. Yeah, lower is better. So the blue just here, multi-core, stays pretty much the same speed. Yeah, if you run um, one workload with one thread, then you can run the same workload with four threads and it's gonna pretty much take the same amount of time. So long as there's no dependencies or you don't have to kind of synchronize your threads, yeah, you'll pretty much get um, linear speed up by adding cores. Of course, there's memory buses and things that come into it too, but let's not go there. Okay, so that was interesting. Let's move on to workload number three. So we will get to mixed workloads in just a minute, but for the moment, we'll just test out some of these simple workloads. So workload number three is just a bunch of SSE instructions, and I've just used add PS, nice and simple floating point instruction, add PS. Now, once again, I've unrolled that loop eight times. And if we have a look at this uh, table, you'll see much the same thing as before. So the add PS instruction requires certain pipes and the hyper threads the second four little rows down here, they're not actually able to work in parallel. Yeah, so we actually only get the effect of two cores when we try and use four hyper threads. And if you have a look at the, at the top rows there, you see that um, four cores, four separate cores, were actually able to get very, very close to four times the performance of um, one core. Having a look at the chart, it's pretty much exactly the same as before. The hyper threads are not able to execute in parallel because the instructions that they're running require the same uh, pipes. Yeah, but if you do use um, different cores, then you do get uh, pretty much a linear speed up in these cases. Okay, that's good. So that's what happens when you run uh, instructions in hyper threads and your instructions all require the same pipes. Your hyper threads are not really able to give uh, any performance uh, at all. Let's move on to something else. Let's move on to mixed workloads. In these mixed workloads, what I did was uh, I split the two hyper threads and we made one execute uh, integer and the other execute floating point. So for this first little one here, we used uh, the workload one, which was the general purpose ink instructions or increment. And the second one was um, workload three, which was the SSE instructions that we just saw. It no longer makes sense to just run one thread anymore because we're using um, a split workload. So we want at least both the ink and the SSE to run. So I'm doing this in pairs of threads. We've got two, four, six, eight, then two, four, six, eight. And if you have a bit of a look at the second from last column and indeed the last column, the cycles there on the end, you'll see that the hyper threads actually start to perform fairly well, fairly well indeed. For this test, I was letting the operating system divvy out the workloads itself for the first four rows. So I wasn't specifying which uh, cores any of this stuff should go to. I just made like four or eight threads or whatever and just said, you know, to the operating system, do your best, mate, off you go. When the operating system was scheduling itself uh, for two, four, six and eight cores, uh, we actually ended up getting a performance of about 2.73 times the two core performance from our eight threads. But having a look down at the hyper-threading version, so the first row just there for hyper-threading, that's this fourth row just here, uh, came out at 0 0.87. So it's actually quite a bit slower than letting the operating system uh, manage your threading for you. And the reason for that is that with our two hyper-threads, we're forcing those two hyper-threads through one core. But the operating system naturally just um, split the first two uh, workloads to different cores and so it got better performance but and this is the interesting bit this is the interesting bit as we start to saturate the cpu with instructions and hyper threads what you find is that by the time we get to six hyper threads and eight hyper threads the hyper threads actually overtake what the operating system was doing with its scheduling so what this means is that if you can schedule your workloads so that you've got hyper threads kind of in pairs doing um, different types of workloads, say integer and floating point, 
then you tend to gain a little performance over the, the operating system scheduling itself. Have a look at this little chart down here. We actually get a little performance bonus from our uh, hyper threading, which is pretty good. Interesting that uh, this only happens with um, when you sort of start to saturate your CPU. Okay, and something similar happens when we do uh, AVX. So here I've got uh, AVX workloads. I think it's mixed workloads again. This is um, AVX uh, floating point and AVX uh, integer. I just used um, VP add or V add PS. And what was the other one? VP and. Yeah, the and instruction. And you see basically exactly the same thing. So when the operating system schedules itself, Where's the time? Getting about 2.92 times the performance of two threads from its eight threads. But if we schedule and we force the integer instructions and the floating point instructions to kind of pair together in each core and hyper thread, then we actually end up with a much better score of 3.37. And have a look at the chart. We pretty much see exactly the same thing as before. Okay, so that's pretty good. If you can pair your um, instructions, your workloads up like that, I mean, it's not often that you can, but if you can do that, then you do get a nice little bonus over the operating system scheduling for you. But let's move on to something else. So I was thinking um, it'd be interesting to see the performance if these things are not unrolled. Normally, if you're writing any kind of um, fast code, you want to unroll it or you want to make sure that the um, compiler is unrolling it because if it's not, then you know your code is running at like a quarter the speed that it should be. Uh, but anyway, so this, this test just here, I ran through pretty much the same thing as before. I think it is. Uh, integer and SSE, this is. Yeah, so this would be ink and add PS, SSE. I did two, four, six, eight threads. So once again, we're sending these through as pairs. Yeah, we're sending um, ink and add PS to hyperthread together. And we're letting the operating system do the scheduling during the first four. And then after that, we're doing the hyperthreading ourselves. And what you can see from this is that if you don't unroll your loop, the hyperthreading version and the operating system scheduling itself are pretty much identical. We get about four times the performance when we go to eight cores or eight threads from two threads. And that's pretty much what, ex what you'd expect. So that's pretty much a linear speed up. But we do know from that that that's not a good way to program anyway. I mean, we really we really do want to be unrolling. Yeah, but that, that still might be interesting. You get pretty much a linear speed up from um, yeah what the operating system's doing. And if you try and uh, hyper thread yourself, no benefit at all. Uh, down here in the chart, it's scaled a little bit weirdly. So you can see down the bottom there, it's not actually zero. It starts at 11.65. Yeah, so everything kind of looks exaggerated. Yeah, very small difference. For this final test, I thought it'd be interesting just to compare the performance of four cores versus uh, eight hyper threads. This is sort of testing if uh, hyper threading does anything at all. We kind of know that it does, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what this is testing. So this test is rigged, I will admit. This is very unfair on the four cores because what I've done, I've got these uh, first eight threads just here. These are using uh, only four cores. So the four cores actually have to uh, execute two workloads each and they kind of have to do that in serial. And that's why you see some really weird times. Um, one, 1, 1.2, 1.8, 2.3, 2.7, then back to 1.8 when we add the sixth thread. Yeah, these strange times are because the cores actually have to execute these things in serial. But as we move down here to the hyper threads, you know, eight hyper threads, well, they don't have to execute in serial. So you pretty much just see a slow increase from 1.1 all the way up to about 4.2 times the performance. So if we have a bit of a look at the chart, just there, you can see that obviously hyper threading when you're dealing with this sort of stuff is, is much, much faster than just using um, cores in serial. Yeah, I don't think that's much of a surprise and uh, the cores weren't supposed to win this one, but yeah, just interesting to point out the difference. I should mention that uh, the integer instruction, what was it, VP add, I think? VP add D? Yeah, VP add D is actually faster than V add PS. Yeah, so that uh, initial strange performance there from um, 1 to 1 1.2, that's because uh, VP add D actually has a reciprocal throughput of one third, or you get three per clock cycle. Whereas for VADPS, it's a slower instruction and you only get two per clock cycle. Um, you want to have a look at uh, Agnafog's instruction tables if you want to see all the reciprocal throughput for uh, all of the instructions. But what it pretty much means is that VADPS is a slower instruction. Yeah, and that kind of explains some of the quirky um, times that we've gotten there. Um, this is the best case scenario. I mean, this is really letting hyperthreads shine. 
And in practice, they don't tend to give anything like twice the performance. But yeah, it's, it's good stuff anyway. Good stuff. Okay, well, that's about it, really. That's all of the tests. Interesting stuff. So basically, the, the, the idea with hyperthreading is um, if you can get your hyperthreads to perform different sorts of workloads or to execute instructions which require different pipes, then you can gain a lot of performance. That's often easier said than done. And um, you know, how often can you do that? But still, hyperthreading does tend to give you a little bit of extra performance. Hyperthreads share the ALUs. They also share the caches, I think. So it's really only the registers that they've got um, to themselves. And other than that, the, um, yeah, the hyperthreads share a lot of resources, which is kind of why they don't turn out to be that that useful. Uh, I do think, and this wasn't tested here, but multitasking. So when the operating system is running a lot of background tasks, if you didn't have hyperthreading, it would have to switch to a context switch a lot more often. And that involves sort of saving the registers and then, you know, jumping off to some other code to run. And with hyperthreading, you would kind of, in theory, you would halve the number of those context switches. So maybe, maybe hyperthreading would uh, would really shine in uh, multitasking for the operating system. Yeah, running all of those little background tasks. Who knows? Anyway, interesting question. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I hope that was interesting to people. And uh, I just want you to have a really good day. So, I mean, adios, eh? <laughs>